Good morning, everybody. My name is Brooke Phillips. I'm the Marketing Manager for Shield Healthcare, and welcome to our webinar today on nutrition tips for older adults, healthy eating, and active living over 65. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Attendees will be in listen-only mode, so if you have a question, please type it in the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, there's also a PDF of the presentation slides available for download. You can find that also on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you're watching this presentation as part of a group, there are a couple of forms your group will need to qualify for CE credit as well. At the end of the webinar, we'll go over what you can expect regarding CE credits for this presentation. Uh, your presenter today is Kelly Sparks, RN, BSN, CWOCN, CFCN with Capital Nursing Education. Kelly has been at CWOCN for over 25 years and a nurse for over 30. She's worked in wound, ostomy, and continence care for most of her career. She's been on the board of directors of the Pacific Coast region several times in the past, as well as being on multiple projects for the WOCN certification board. She's active with the local Sacramento WOC nurse group and serves as secretary. Kelly has recently retired from Dignity Health, but she continues with her private practice. She's also been a speaker for many different conferences and classes and enjoys speaking for SHIELD healthcare webinars and working with Capital Nursing Education to help promote education necessary for the care of patients. At this time, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Kelly. Kelly, it's all yours. Thank you, Brooke. So we're going to look at this um, prevention, healthy eating and active living for people over 65. You know, for, uh, these are the objectives that I want to look at here with you. And the first thing is we're going to look at why is it necessary to focus on prevention? Review the clinical signs of nutritional deficiency. Um, we're gonna learn ways to assist with seniors getting adequate nutrition. Um, I wanna look at the ways to assist with the psychological aspect of, um, of helping them with their nutrition and why they need that. Consider different ways to prevent malnutrition in seniors and explore the exercises necessary for healthy living in senior years. So prevention is very important due to the increase of the number of older populations. This is gonna be even larger number as the medical world finds cures and treatments for diseases. So with this increase comes some issues. There's some issues with um, related to the care of our elderly. The quality of life becomes very, very important for them. Um, as this increase in the elderly population grows. Diet and nutrition is crucial for quality of life. So malnutrition either can be either under or over nutrition, and it increases the health risk. Obesity, of course, leads to the chronic diseases in older populations. There are certain changes that um, challenge their nutritional status. And we're going to touch on a few of these as we go along. The first one is the reduced energy expenditure, we'll talk about. The um, physiological, pathological, and the mental and psychological changes that they have. Financial status, disease, lack of ability to shop and cook, and of course the medications as well. So the reduced energy expenditure, you know, older people do less, they eat less, they, and that decreases their micronutrient intake. So the decrease in the energy that they need, for instance, they don't do a lot of exercise sometimes. Um, it can cause a decrease in those micronutrients. So we need to look at how we can get enough into them when they aren't as hungry as they used to be. They're definitely eating less than they used to be. So, the um, physiological changes with aging, a lot of times they have dry mouth and they have a really difficult time swallowing the food. Um, their teeth, sometimes they have some problems with their teeth and that limits their food choices. Sometimes they can't chew enough to get the good proteins in. Taste and smell diminishes and I can tell you that from I have experience with my own father, who I'm trying to get him to eat right. Um, he only tastes the nice sweet things, and all he wants is sweet things. So we have to really watch that. Their gastrointestinal changes, they can have atrophic uh, gastritis, 
that causes the malabsorption and it makes it so they don't get all their nutrients that way. Their gastric emptying slows and that causes, of course, then another decrease in their, um, in their appetite. Sometimes it's really hard to get elderly people to eat, especially the right thing. Um, medical problems play a huge part. Heart failure, for instance. They might be even too weak to sit there and chew. COPD is a huge problem because they can't breathe well enough to chew and swallow. Sometimes it's so bad that they have to take tiny, tiny bites and it's kind of hard to get all the nutrients that they need. Malabsorption, like I mentioned, with atrophic gastritis, um, dysphagia, sometimes they just can't get enough food down. And then with diabetes and Parkinson's disease, infection, pneumonia, even UTI when they become confused, malignancy, they may have a throat cancer, a tongue cancer, lip cancer, or even just having to deal with the chemotherapy of their um, cancer. Arthritis plays a big part. They have a hard time feeding themselves sometimes, even holding the pork. And of course, there's alcoholism, which happens in the elderly sometimes, and they fill up on the wrong things. Mental and, um, and psychological health. When you have somebody that is full of anxiety, they, maybe they do have dementia and some Alzheimer's disease or whatever, and they end up being so anxious and so sometimes they're um, afraid you're poisoning them. They get confused and they don't want to eat. A lot of times depression plays a part, plays a part where they just don't care, don't want to eat, don't care. A lot of times it's the death of a, of a wife or, or, or a husband, and they just, you know, they don't want to deal with food at all. And again, alcoholism. Um, food is not their drug of choice when they are um, wanting alcohol. Financial challenges, I can remember when I first had kids and had very little income and I can remember going to the store and buying things that would help fill my children up because I didn't have enough money for the, the you know, better food. So this is what happens with people who um, don't have enough money to buy adequate food. They're going to buy things that are not... Um, as nutritious and less value to their body, but they need to do that because they don't have enough money. Elderly people sometimes purchase things that are on sale or things that are less nutritional because they can't afford the meat product or um, the produce that they need. So, and they can't pay for help or get it, you know, or get uh, their food fixed by somebody else because they don't have the money to do that makes it very difficult to get food in. And then there's the social issues again, the poverty, isolation. You know, isolation is huge with this population and they don't want to admit that they can't do it themselves. Um, a lot of people will uh, tend to go towards the microwavable food, which is not as good nutritionally as it could be. Um, and then, of course, again, the inability to shop and prepare and cook meals. Sometimes it's a vision challenge, too. They can't. I remember my mom could not cook anymore. And, you know, this happens, and they need help. So they don't get the right nutrition when they can't cook. Medications can play a huge part that can cause the anorexia in older people. A lot of the meds that you see here can make them feel less hungry, um, actually make them lose weight because of that. Antibiotics can cause diarrhea, can cause problems with, they don't want to eat because they know they're going to have to go to the bathroom, that kind of thing. And then any chemotherapy is going to make them feel, you know, sick to the stomach or whatever and have to go ahead and eat less. So, Looking at the um, musculoskeletal uh, meds as well, the NSAIDs and the methotrexate, things like that, that's going to cause them a little bit of problem as well, or it can cause them to not want to eat. Diseases, cancer in elderly, 
that causes a release of the cytokines. The cytokines is what causes the nausea and the vomiting and the decreased bowel motility. Um, they become cachectic and they become have that cachectic anorexic uh, syndrome that does play a huge part in their lack of nutrition. When we look at the etiology of weight loss in older patients, there's three things, the wasting, cachexia, and sarcopenia. They all work together to cause the elderly to lose weight. Um, there's an involuntary loss of weight primarily caused by the inadequate dietary intake. Then comes the involuntary loss of the fat-free mass, which is caused by catabolism, or you know, it just definitely this is characterized by raised metabolic rate um, and increased protein degradation. Along with this wasting and cachexia, they end up with sarcopenia. That is the involuntary loss of muscle mass, and it may be intrinsic part of aging process rather than um, from any associated disease. So the three work together, causing that weight loss in the elderly. So if you look at this um, pathways here, this is quite interesting. Let's start with the inactivity in the lower left. Um, this leads to the weakness, sarcopenia, increased fat mass loss, and decreased growth hormone secretion. The decreased central nervous system, or excuse me, the decreased growth hormone secretion, if you follow the guide there, that along with the decrease in the central nervous system input, and the cytokines all lead to decreased muscle mass and decreased muscle quality, and that leads to sarcopenia as well. All of that causes weakness and decrease in metabolic or the metabolic reserves, and that leads to disability, mor um, morbidity, and mortality. So this is a really good little um, guide that shows you exactly what happens with sarcopenia. Fluid and electrolyte imbalance, that's a huge problem with, this, uh, with the elderly. Partially become, because they may have some renal impairment and changes in thirst perception, so they're just not thirsty, so they're not drinking as much as they should. Sometimes it's a physical disability or cognitive impairment, and that, that causes the lack of fluid intake. It's really hard to get them to get enough fluid in. I know with patients, you can set it by them. Sometimes they can't reach it. Sometimes they fill it. Nobody knows. And even with people in the home, you know, I've even tried putting numbers on the bottle. You know, by the end of the day, you need to have this bottle, you know, and this bottle done, you know, however much you want them to drink. It's really difficult to get that fluid into them. And then finding things that they like is better, sometimes using Gatorade or, you know, something that, that they like to drink instead of just plain water um, makes a huge difference. Malnutrition, this is defined as a state of being poorly nourished. Okay, that can be a lack of one or more nutrients, which is the undernutrition, or an excess of nutrients, which is, of course, overnutrition. For this lecture, we're going to concentrate on malnutrition, referring to the state of undernutrition, because that is much more common in this population. Prevalence of malnutrition. In the hospital population, just general hospital population, is between 11 and a half, I'm sorry, 11% and 44%. But in the elderly group, that's huge, 29 to 61%. Nutritional assessment. So there's several different nutritional, nutritional assessments available. One is the malnutrition universal screening tool, and that's commonly used in the clinical practices. It only takes about three to five minutes. The other one is, another one is the mini nutritional assessment, and that is designed for older patients. It takes less than 15 minutes to do that. The WHO, or the World Health Organization, they um, say that underweight is a BMI less than 18.5%, 
normal is 18.5 to 24.9, and overweight is 25 to 29.9, and then obesity is 30 to 39.9, and then extreme obesity is higher than 40. Clinical signs and nutritional uh, deficiencies. This is quite interesting. Of you know, we all know that with wound healing, a lot of us have been in wound care. Um, zinc and vitamin C are really good, and if they have poor wound healing, that can be a deficiency in the, uh, zinc and vitamin C. Looking at the skin, there's all kinds of different things. Um, petechiae, for instance, could be a deficiency in, in vitamin C and vitamin K. Um, scrotal dermatitis. I never knew that riboflavin had anything to do with cats, but apparently it does. Then with the hair, thin, depigmented hair, um, that can be a protein, you know, a lack of protein. And then the easily pluckable hair, um, that can be protein and or zinc. Nails, if you look at their nails, then um, it could be, if you look for the transverse deep pigmentation, that can be an albumin problem. Or spooned nails, we know that's iron. Night blindness, again, the vitamin A and zinc. Riboflavin also will help the conjunctival um, inflammation, and vitamin A helps the keratomalacia, which is where the, when the cornea breaks down, and it liquefies, and that leads to blindness. So vitamin A is very, very important for these people. Again, the mouth, they can have bleeding gums if they're lacking vitamin C or riboflavin. Um, glottitis, that is, of course, niacin and, and riboflavin as well. There's so many different things. In the neck, they can have a, a thyroid enlargement, which is, of course, a lack of Iodine, protein, sometimes the lack of protein can cause a parotid enlargement. Um, if they suffer from diarrhea, they can have a lack of vitamin B12, niacin, and the list goes on. In the extremities, vitamin D, vitamin C, protein, selenium, uh, vitamin D, all of those things, and thiamine, have to do with the tenderness of bones, the joint pain, muscle tenderness, and um, muscle wasting. So along with the neurological things, vitamin B12 is huge with neurological things. You can see there there's one, two, three, four different things that happen that can be a uh, deficiency in vitamin B12 and niacin as well for dementia. Thiamine, hypoflexia, so there's so many things. Uh, there is one here that is, I believe it's the uh, paradoxin, is, is also known as vitamin B6. And hypojusia, that is the reduced ability to taste things, that is really huge in this population. So up on the mouth area, when you see zinc and vitamin A, um, that can help them to be able to taste food a little bit better so that they can get food down. So there are different ways to combat this or prevent malnutrition. We're going to talk about what we can do to help these people over 65. Um, there's different calories needed for adults, older adults, than there are, of course, for younger. And the amount depends on how physically active they are. Um, for instance, men over 65, if they're sedentary, they only need about 2,000 if they are um, out riding bikes and doing physical activity, then they're going to need 2,600 calories per day. Women, on the other hand, need less. A sedentary female gets about, needs about 1,600, and an active female requires about 2,000 calories a day. Protein, different sources include meat, fish, chicken, beans, and dairy products. Um, men, again, they're going to need more, 56 grams of protein a day, whereas women, we only need about 46 grams of protein a day. 
fiber um, recommended intake is 14 grams of fiber for every 1,000 calories per day. So men over 65, approximately 28 grams of fiber a day is good for them. And women, it's only 22 grams of fiber. Vitamins and minerals. Um, in older people, eating whole foods, we're talking about vegetables, fruits, um, good quality protein, food that is of value to their system. Men and women should both have 600 international units of vitamin D from fish, egg yolks, fortified foods, and supplements every day. Um, and then the amount of vitamin B6 needed increases with age. So you want to look at the chicken, fish, potatoes, and, and fruit. Men need 1.7 milligrams per day, and women only need 1.5 milligrams per day. So let's look at some ways that we can increase their intake. First of all, we want to encourage them to eat when they're hungry. So a lot of times that may be six small meals per day, just as they're going on, because they're not going to eat a whole lot at one time. And then provide snacks often. There's ways that you can prepare hot cereals, for instance, with um, and soups with milk or cream instead of water. That's going to increase their caloric intake. Um, top the vegetables or noodles with cheese, cream sauce, or butter. Add butter or cream, sour cream to the pasta, the soups, the eggs, uh, vegetable dishes, and casseroles. The other thing is to spread margarine or peanut butter. Peanut butter is a really good protein source. Honey or cream cheese or mayonnaise on sandwiches and toast for them. Um, you can add cheeses, ricotta cheese or cottage cheese to casseroles and desserts. Basically, everything that you would be doing to lose weight <laughs> that you wouldn't eat, you want to prepare for them so that they can get more caloric value. Another thing would be coating chicken with the bread, breadcrumbs before you cook it. Um, vegetables as well. Plenty of fluids such as milk, soy milk, milkshakes, and or fruit juice. Whipped cream, add marshmallows to their potatoes, whatever. Raisins or dates into dessert foods. All these kind of things will increase their calorie intake. The importance of protein intake. Um, of course, it's good for healing, and it helps to build new cells, and it's a source of fuel for the body. So we need to encourage them to eat as much protein as we can. And the ways to increase the protein, you can add that powdered milk. Um, add protein powder to the egg or cereal. Soup. You can chop up meat and add, you know, meat to your soup. Um, you can add that protein powder to anything. And I've seen a lot of people use it in things even like rice and pasta cream sauces, or even in yogurt. And if a patient or a person really likes yogurt, you can add a lot of things to that. Um, you can add yogurt to milk or fruit smoothies. Um, add meat, tofu, beans, or eggs to soups, casseroles, and, po and pasta dishes. Again, with the cheeses and the sauces, you can add cheese to just about anything. And they'll enjoy the taste better, especially if you add a little bit of spices to it. One of the things that I've noticed in my 30 years plus of nursing is that the elderly seem to have a real focus on their bowels. And we've all heard that. I mean, that's their biggest worry. I haven't had a bowel movement today. Oh, my gosh. You know, and one of the things that they need, not only to make them feel better, is that dietary fiber. So it does help reduce heart disease and cancer, improve digestive health, lowers the cholesterol and blood sugar levels, and reduces type 2 diabetes, the risk of type 2 diabetes. Helps with weight management, and it aids with their regularity, which is going to help them a lot. Um, provides more vitamins or important vitamins and minerals and plant compounds to help prevent um, chronic diseases. So fiber is huge, and I can't tell you how many patients have just, and family members, just totally 
feel like they're lost if their bowels are not in order. So really look at this fiber intake. Whole grains is the best um, fruits and vegetables, and they, they're a natural source of, of fiber, and it really helps these people to have that, fruit and vegetables especially. But let's look at what is a whole grain. A whole grain, it must be the bran, the endosperm, and the germ. Now your refined grains, they take that endosperm and use that. Bran and germ are lost in the processing and um, that makes it have a longer shelf life and smoother texture, but the nutrients are gone as well. So even your enriched products, they're still low in dietary fiber. The best thing is to realize that the whole fiber matters. The bran is the outer shell. It protects the seeds. Um, it has fiber and vitamin D, trace minerals. The endosperm provides energy. That's your carbohydrate protein. And the germ is the most important. That's the nutrient storehouse. It has the antioxidants uh, and the vitamin E and B vitamins and healthy fats. And thank you, General Mills, for that photo. <laughs> um, health benefits of whole grains. Again, they're nutrient dense. Your iron and vitamin B and magnesium, selenium reduces the inflammation and it is more nutrient. And again, think of the value in the body. What kind of value does that have to the body? That's what you want to get into that. There's some examples of some um, whole grain products. One of them that um, a lot of people really like is quinoa. And that is easy to fix. You can put things in it to make it have more calorie intake along with the fiber. Um, but every one of these things that you see, rye is really good. Um, you can put barley in the soup. Brown rice, whole rice, whole brown rice is good. Buckwheat. Um, and, of course, anything whole wheat. And you have to read the labels because a lot of these things, especially bread, it's going to say whole wheat. But then how much of it is whole wheat? You have to really look at it and see if it actually does have the whole grain in it. So make sure that you, you know, check that out. Oats is good. Um, most people, even if you cook it down, um, most people, that's a, a good, it's a good texture for them, um, like in the oatmeal. Increase the fruits and veggies. These are low in calories, high in nutrients. It's increased fiber. Um, there's all kinds of anti-inflammatory properties in there. And one thing I didn't realize until I did this is organic produce is more anti-inflammatory than conventional. I'm one of those that always said, oh, why should I buy organic? I can buy, you know, regular. But when I see that there's more anti-inflammatory properties, it makes a big difference. Up to two-thirds of total food intake should be from fruits and vegetables to fight inflammation. So that's very important. And because of the fact that when they lose their taste buds um, over time, the last to go is the sweet. So they taste. Elderly people taste sweet things a lot more than they taste um, anything else. You want to decrease, decrease the refined sugars and added sugars. Most packaged snacks, elderly people like to go in the store and get prepackaged stuff. Most of that has um, refined carbs and added sugars in it. And they can overstimulate insulin response, leads to pro-inflammatory and compounds such as, oh, that word again, erythrodynamic. I don't know, I've never heard of this until I did this. Um, erythrodynamic acid, it's a polyunsaturated um, omega-6 fatty acid that's found in our body. It's in our membranes and our, of our muscles and, and our liver, but also mostly in our brain. Um, it's obtained from meat products and can cause muscle tissue inflammation. So there's good and there's bad. So one of the things that we need to do is eat the things that are pro-inflammatory, um, that have this um, erythrodynamic in it, this erythrodynamic acid in it. 
it's very, very interesting how that works because you need it, but there's, like I said, good and there's bad. And I could go into all that, but I'm, I don't think it's correct for this lecture. But it's very, very important to look at that. Increased omega-3 fatty acids. These, these fats fight against inflammation by reducing the erythrodonic acid production. And that helps to generate anti-inflammatory compounds such as resolvins. Resolvins, these are byproducts of the omega-3 fatty acids. And they're molecules that promote resolution of cellular inflammation. And they allow inflamed tissue to return to homeostasis. So we really need to look at these, you know, fish is the best. Salmon, um, these things we need to take in order to get that anti-inflammatory compound. Examples of omega-3 fatty acids, the flax or chia seeds, um, canola oil, walnuts, freshwater fish, uh, salmon, anchovies, sardines, halibut, fish oil, krill oil, krill oil, and seaweed. You know, when I think of what some of the elderly people like in my life, um, a cracker with cheese on it and then a sardine on it. I mean, they're getting that omega-3 fatty acids along with the calorie intake. And if you get the right kind of cracker, you can have that black tea in that as well. So that's one of the snacks that, you know, I like to provide for my dad because that's what he likes. Prevention, medical nutrition therapy. You know, MNT is called. It's a therapeutic approach to prevention, usually uh, developed by a dietitian who has reviewed the specific needs of the patient. Um, healthy eating and nutrition that supplements your physician's prescribed treatment. So MNT is a good thing to do when you have trouble with getting food in. You really need to look at that dietitian for some help. So as far as um, as far as getting this, it, it is very effective. It strengthens the treatment of multiple conditions, um, diabetes, hypertension, wound care, and cancer. So MNT is a preventative way of um, helping our elderly. The cost of it, some insurances will cover it. Um, they'll cover the re registered dietitian uh, due to the importance of prevention. Um, of the health condition. It's a shame that fewer than 30% of medical schools provide that minimum 25 hours of nutritional teaching that's recommended by the National Academy of Sciences. That's just a shame. Medicare Part B, uh, they may cover MNT, but mostly if the patient has diabetes or kidney disease, or if they've had a kidney transplant within the last 36 months. So this would be a good thing to look into for some people that, that really need help with getting the um, nutritional intake in. You know, dietitians are a special type of um, preventative medicine um, pushers. They are so good at helping with getting the, the protein and all of the different things that, that the elderly need. I love working with dietitians in the hospital. Medical nutrition therapy, it also may include the nutrition and lifestyle assessment. There may be a group um, nutritional services or it may be individual and they help to manage the lifestyle factors that affect diabetes especially. Follow-up visits to check on the progress and managing their dietary needs, they really follow through well. What is the importance of nutrition in diabetes? You know, they did a study of 3,234 people with prediabetes. And what they took some people and they put them on a lifestyle change program where they did intensive dieting and exercise and training um, and had them lose 7% of body weight and maintain weight loss. Then they took another third and put them on metformin, 850 uh, milligrams twice a day with a standard advice about diet and exercise. Then they took the other third and put them on a placebo. Placebo twice a day with standard advice about diet and exercise. And diet and exercise, of course, change, the changes resulted in more weight loss. 
Diet and exercise changes resulted in lowering the rate of developing diabetes more than those on metformin alone. So basically what their study of 3,234 people with prediabetes showed that a combination of the metformin as well as a healthy diet and exercise is best. And I think most of us have known that, but at least it was proven and um, we can use that in the literature, or it is in the literature. Nutrition in wound healing, that's one of my favorite things to think about is wound healing. And the NPUAP panel says that it's essential to address nutrition in every individual that has any pressure injuries. And we try to do that. Um, if they're malnourished or dehydrated, wound healing will take much longer. Good nutrition is a very powerful addition to any treatment plan for wound care, um, and it should be made a priority. Daily multivitamin is important, and as I said before, zinc and vitamin C are very important with wound healing. So it just it, it just makes sense. You have to have it, or it it just a lot of times it's not going to heal. So um, one of the things that I've noticed in the facilities over the years, talking about achieving better nutrition here, um, is the difficulty of feeding patients. Proper positioning is so important. I've seen people lying flat, you know, when I go in these different facilities, laying flat or on their side trying to reach their tray. They can't reach it. Um, it was left next to them, and then they walked away. I've seen other times where I've seen them just literally shove food into their mouth, like pureed food, and you don't even see that they're swallowing, and they just keep putting the food in there. Um, one thing that I don't like is finding the tray across the room on the sink or somewhere and the patient sitting there waiting for someone to bring it to them or to push that table over to them. Um, but I will say I've also seen some really good, good aides and nurses that can get people to eat. It's incredible. It's a skill. If you have an Alzheimer patient that is much like feeding a baby. It, it really is. Um, there needs to be cueing and touching. Sometimes if you, I've seen, I've seen them do this and it's so good. They'll touch the cheek so they turn their face that way to give them the food or touch the chin to make the mouth open. Um, one of the things that's real funny is when, um, when I was, <laughs> I used to watch my mom feed my little brother when I was a kid and I always laughed at her because she was open her mouth, ah, uh, you know, to the baby. And um, then I found myself with my kids doing the same thing, and I kind of had to laugh about that. But mirroring is very good for the elderly, too. When you get somebody who's confused and they don't want to eat and they're just, you know, whatever, and you get their attention just right, touch their face, whatever, you open your mouth and they're going to probably open theirs, too. It is really amazing how that works. Most people eat better if they are fed culturally appropriate foods. Um, and you can either talk to them if you can and make sure what they like to eat. Um, sit them at a table. Make sure they're having, like these people sitting here, you know, make sure, of course, they look very healthy. But um, making sure that the patient feels the socialization that's going on or, you know, like in terms of my dad. If we are all sitting at the table together, he eats a better meal. Um, it's very difficult to sit and eat by yourself. There is also appetite suppressants that can help as well. So you just really need to be creative in feeding them. And like I said, I've seen some wonderful, wonderful nurses and aides that can get patients to eat where I wouldn't think they could. There is also things like having a regular daily routine. That's so important for these people. Um, and also smaller portions. If you, It's just like with a kid. If you put a great big portion on there, they're going to go, oh, I can't eat all that. And they lose their appetite. If you put small portions, a couple bites, they get it down, you can always put more on there. And sometimes it's best to serve them food that they don't need to have utensils. Finger foods are great. I know even with my dad, I'll take a, a pork chop 
and bake it and then have it um, with a little bone in there. And he'll sit there and eat that whole pork chop. Whereas if he has to cut it or if I cut it up even, it's too much trouble to use that fork. Um, cheese sticks, string cheese, um, full fat yogurt, diced fruit, peanut butter and crackers, like this guy's got a piece of toast with some jelly on it, um, full fat cottage cheese or whole chocolate milk. These things all help. They help to get the food in. Okay, another thing, if chewing is difficult or tiring, consider more liquid foods. Of course, this is not good for people with swallowing problems, but if they don't have swallowing problems, you know, one of the things that I learned here that I really, a lot of things I learned doing this because I didn't know some of this, pureed meats. If you take pureed meats and add them to a soup, that's getting the protein into the soup. If, if a person likes cream soup, add some cream, olive oil, the pureed meat. You can puree the vegetables too and get them in there. And then they're eating the soup, not knowing that they're also getting all that meat. Smoothies are really good, and most people like them. Adding fruits and vegetables to that, you can you can use, again, that full-fat yogurt, which has a lot of protein in it. Hot cocoa may be better for them um, to get their, their nutritional intake than is coffee and full-fat milk used for that. Milkshake, good quality ice cream is better than eating nothing. So, um, again, this is not for people with dysphagia, but... You really need to um, think about what you can do to make it easier for them to take it in. Keeping track is important. Um, you want to keep track of what foods they enjoy, what they like and don't like. Take some notes and keep experimenting. Um, track what time of the day that they like to eat or are more willing to eat and be very patient and creative. Like I said, there's a lot of ways to get food into people. If you just think about it and be creative, look up some stuff online and make sure that you can um, keep track and take notes of what works. Especially if you're in a, in a hospital situation or in a skilled nursing situation where the next person is gonna need to know what works. It's better to keep notes, let everybody see it, put it in their room, than to have um, somebody have to start all over with experimenting. Solve their discomfort issues. Um, medications have a lot of side effects. The dry mouth, you can act, ash, sorry, you can actually ask them to chew some sugarless gum. That will help, um, or brush your teeth before the meal. I've seen some people who their mouths are just horrible, and then somebody comes in and tries to feed them. I wouldn't want to eat either. You've got to brush your teeth first, Use an oral rinse if you have to, but really get rid of those strange tastes in their mouth that medication can, can sometimes cause. And then they'll be, more, um, they'll be more able to eat. Things that help to make mealtime pleasant, even in a hospital or, or in a skilled nursing facility or even at home. Soft music, turn on that TV and get some good soft music going. Um, Set their plate nice, make it look pretty, a little flower here or something. Of course, candles at home would be nice. And if you can, stay there with them a little while or have a family member come in at mealtime to stay there with them while they eat. It makes a huge difference. The presentation makes a huge difference. I can tell you that there are certain foods like one salad that we make all the time. If I put it all together in a salad and give it to my dad, he he told me, I think you just threw a whole bunch of stuff in a bowl. Well, I did. It's a salad. But I have found that I need to separate that for him because he feels better looking at a plate that has certain things in certain places. A lot of people don't like mixing food. And so um, really think about the presentation. You know, in this population, they lose a lot of control of all kinds of other things. Um, so we want to give them back some of the control. Involve them in the meal eating, um, in the meal planning, I mean. Give them choices between foods and try to give them back some of the control in their life. It really helps, especially to get those, those nutrients into them. 
The other thing is serving water between meals. You want to make sure that they're getting enough fluid. However, you don't want to give it to them right at mealtime because if you serve a lot of liquids during mealtime, they're going to get full. And it's the same thing, like I said before, I with my grandkids. I can't let them have their milk until they eat some of their food or they'll fill up on the milk. So it's important because to give them water during the day because dehydration can also suppress their appetite. So um, although sometimes you need to give them a little sip to, you know, moisten their mouth and their throat so they can follow, swallow their food safely, but um, you want to keep the majority of beverages for after their meal for relaxation, but do encourage that drinking between meals. Um, stronger flavored, like I said, seasoning more. Um, I have to salt the heck out of my dad's food, and I hate to, but he doesn't have a problem with salt, thank God, because um, he does not taste it. And pepper works well, too. He, he just doesn't taste it unless there's some kind of spices in there. Experiment with different temperatures. Some people like colder food rather than real warm. Um, you might even stimulate their, al their alcohol their appetite with a little alcohol. You know, a little drink before dinner is not going to hurt them, and it's going to help stimulate that appetite. And take advantage of their hungry moments. If they say they're hungry, give them something. No, you don't have to wait until dinner time. <laughs> so physical activity guidelines for older adults. Of course, this lady, she's pretty active. Looks like she's doing pretty good. Um, but they do need to have aerobic and strength exercises. The amount, of course, that they get depends on their age. Aerobic exercises for adults 65 or, old, or older, um, no limiting health conditions. They can ride a bike um, at least 150 minutes of moderate aerobic activity, like cycling or walking every week is what is recommended. And that can include water aerobics, ballroom and line dancing, um, riding a bike on, on level ground, mostly, or with few heels, uh, playing double tennis, anything that gets them moving around, canoeing, volleyball, pushing a lawnmower, even so much as taking, taking groceries in after, a, um, after going shopping. That, it, just little things help. There's other ways of doing strength exercises with people who cannot do these things, and I'm talking strength instead of the aerobic, but they can actually do the um, things with one of those um, bands, the stretch bands work really well for people with, with a limited amount of ability to exercise. For older, less active, there's uh, tons of ways, even like I said, just bringing in the groceries. Active and passive range of motion works really well with people who cannot get out of bed or wheelchair. It all depends on their ability. So again, carrying or moving heavy objects. Um, activities that involve stepping and jumping. Dancing is good. Heavy gardening is good. Um, exercises that use your body weight for resistance, like push-ups or sit-ups. Yoga, Pilates, lifting weights. So remember, the more they move, the longer they will be able to move. Once they're down, they're always down. So you want to keep them, because of our, our um, preventative methods that we have with the nutrition and exercise, we can certainly help to maintain a better quality of life as the quantity, um, as well as quantity in some cases. Whether it's you or your loved ones or patients that are over 65, prevention is the best medicine for a long, healthy, an active life. So I put the references in here, um, quite a few that will be very helpful if you're doing further research on this. You can see NPUAP, Shield Healthcare, um, the NIDDK, a lot of different references that you can use. And now I'll turn it over to Brooke, and she can talk about the CEs and the contact hour that you get for this, and any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that wonderful presentation. It was very informative.
Thank you so much. We have a bunch of questions coming in, so um, we'll get to those in just a minute. But very quickly, I'm just going to go through the CE, CE contact hour slide. Um, so you can expect to receive your um, CE contact certificate by email coming within the next five to seven business days. That will come directly from Capital Nursing Education. If you don't receive your certificate, please check your spam folder. Um, and if you still don't receive your certificate after five to seven business days, please reach out to us at marketing at showhealthcare.com and we'll coordinate with Capital Nursing to make sure you receive that certificate. And Kelly, if you don't mind, the next slide, please. Wonderful, thank you. And then you can find more information on uh, nutrition and on other topics um, on our community site here, showhealthcare.com slash community. We have several different communities in particular, or one uh, with nutrition information, there's a, it's a very robust community, and that would be at shieldhealthcare.com slash nutrition. You can also see on the right-hand side of the screen, we have information for caregivers, healthcare professionals, and on a variety of other topics. Um, please, uh, next slide, please, Kelly. Wonderful. Here, uh, here we have our free educational booklet. So if you go on to our website here, shieldhealthcare.com slash community, you can download information, these are full 30 to 40 page uh, booklet PDFs. We also have hard copies of many of them we can mail to you. So feel free to look for those online and uh, we hope to be able to get you those resources for yourself and for any loved ones or patients that you have. Um, and right now we'll go ahead and start looking at the questions that are coming in and open it up for that. Please, if you have any questions on Kelly's presentation on nutrition overall, please uh, type it into the question box on the right hand side of your screen and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Let me go ahead and start with some of the ones that came through a little bit earlier in the presentation. Uh, my mother-in-law is in her early 80s. She's still mobile and lives alone, but I worry about her diet. Uh, are there physical signs of undernutrition that I can look for? Kelly, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yes, first of all, of course, the weight loss. But also, if you look back in in the slides, there's a couple of slides that show um, what happens when they're lacking certain vitamins. And that is a really good, and it's in the references as well, but it's a very good way of seeing, for instance, the nails, when we talk about the fingernails and, and the things that can happen with different parts of the body when they're lacking those nutrients. So if you can, look back in the slides, and there's there's definitely a lot of information on those two slides that, that say clinical signs of nutritional deficiency, and that will help you with that. But most of all, the weight loss, the weakness, the muscle wasting, things like that you want to watch for, but you really want to catch it before it happens, so prevention is best. If you can, if you can do some of the things that you've seen in this presentation to help your mom to get that um, nutrition, that would be the best thing that you could do. And then, of course, you can go ahead and get a um, nutritional evaluation from a uh, licensed dietitian. That will help as well. Great. Thank you. Another question that has come in. Can you please specify the reference regarding organic foods having more anti-inflammatory properties? I know we're hitting you uh, off the cuff with a bunch of nutrition questions, but if you have any thoughts on that, uh, Kelly, please, please let us know. You know, I would have to look that up again, and I plan to do that myself because I really don't know the validity of that, but I will have to look that reference up as well. So why don't we um, get an email for that person or have that person email us, and I will find that out and let you know because I want to know that too. Okay, great. We'll do. We, we've got your email. So if we have, if there are questions that we don't address or that we need to do a little research before getting back to you, we'll, we'll definitely do that. Um, one question that I'll answer on my end before we do the next one for you, Kelly. Um, we had a couple of people who had issues downloading the slides. Uh, we did reach out to GoToWebinar, and it seems specific to Chrome. If you use that as your browser, they had an issue with, with that particular file. So um, if anyone is not able to download the slides, please go to shieldhealthcare.com slash community in the next 24 to 48 hours. We'll make sure that the link is available there for you, along with the recording to watch this on demand or reference anything that uh, Kelly has mentioned today. And if you aren't able to locate the slides, just reach out to us at marketing at shieldhealthcare.com and we can email that to you directly. Um, let's see, another question that came in, just a very quick comment about soluble versus insoluble fiber. Is there a difference that, um, in regards to uh, nutrition over 65 that you can share with us, Kelly, about, about I'm sorry, 
soluble versus soluble fiber? You know, not uh, not right offhand. I would have to look that up too because I think that I think that non-soluble, I think, is probably better, but I really don't know that answer. I'll have to look that up and get back to that person. Okay, got it. Great, thank you. Um, another one, uh, I will turn 85 this year. My question is, how much does it really matter what you eat or don't eat at this age? I don't have diabetes or any major illness. Is it okay for me to eat a lot of carbs and a dessert like ice cream for my e evening meal? And by carbs, I mean pasta, potatoes, white rice, or bread. Definitely. You can, you can eat all those things as long as you're watching the uh, caloric intake. You don't want to eat too much because that can be too unhealthy but for somebody 85 yes it does matter depending on how long you want to live um my father says the same thing he's 88 he says why can't i have my peanut m ms and my cookies whenever i want and at one point i said to him dad you know what if you want to eat that you go right ahead but i'm going to tell you that it's not going to be healthy for you it's not going to help you prevent getting diseases and it's certainly not going to help your weight so, um, which again leads to those diseases. So it, it's personal preference, but what I would do if I were you is I would see a licensed dietitian and I would talk about what your likes are and what your dislikes are and come up with a routine that will help you put the most valuable food in your body for what you need. So um, yeah, you could eat whatever you want, but you won't live as long. <laughs> So if you want a good quality of life, you really need to look at that and make sure you're getting all of the vitamins that you need and the nutrients that you need. Good question. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, there's another one. You've actually gotten two questions on this, but I'll, I'll, I'll read one of the two as they're almost identical. Um, are there any special dietary requirements if one is a vegan or a vegetarian and over 65? You know, I think it's pretty much the same, but you're going to have to be creative in getting that protein in. And I know beans and tofu and things like that that, um, that vegan uh, people can eat. But you really, again, need to look at that as far as what is the most valuable for your body. And I definitely, in that case, I would see a dietitian get everything in order, and get your foods lined up so that you're getting all the nutrients that your body needs. And, you know, all the fibers, all the protein, all the calories, all of those things. And, it, you know, it's tricky, but I know a lot of vegans that do just fine. So, again, I would, I would suggest you seek some help with that just to make sure that you're getting everything that you need for your uh, good quality of life. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, another one here. I have some patients with dementia, and they only want to eat strange foods. I hope that getting them to a neurologist, psychiatrist can help them. Other than that, what else can be done? She refuses to eat what is prepared for her. Oh, that's so hard. You know, the tricks, I, it depends on how much dementia, how, how her mind is working. Um, sometimes there's little tricks that you can do. Um, even if you add ketchup to something or, um, or add some different spices to it, whatever you need to do to make it so that it tastes different to her. And probably what's happening is there is no taste. And so the foods that she's wanting probably are things that she can taste. So some of the tricks that I talked about earlier, even, even um, having her eat with somebody, and, and talking as she's eating so that it's not, or even just looking at somebody, so that it's not so much of, here, you need to eat this. Um, control, control is a huge issue, especially with people with dementia. It's, they want to do what they want to do. So, you know, add something to it and get some spices in there and make sure that it tastes for her. I, that's all I can think of is try those tricks of the trade and try to get her to focus on something other than the fact that you're feeding her, you know, something that is um, even a TV show, something that gets her mind off of the fact that she's not in control of what she's eating right now. But if you can take what she likes 
and add protein powder to it and add some, some you know, good fat yogurt, um, something like that, you might be able to get the nutrients in that way. But it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing with, with dementia. It really is. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, I see we, uh, it's 10 o'clock at this point in time, so we'll go ahead and stop the questions. But there are several that did come in. If we haven't gotten to your question, we will reach out to you. We'll go ahead and speak with Kelly and also with our nutritionist or our registered dietitians, and, um, and we'll make sure that we get your questions answered to the best of our ability. If you are looking to watch this presentation on demand, it will be available on our website um, in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. We'll make sure that it's published along with um, the links to the uh, PDF of the presentation of the slides itself. Um, and then if you're looking to attend more Still Healthcare webinars, we do have our next schedule our, for the rest of the year is now published. Um, and you can go to stillhealthcare.com slash events, see those webinars, and we'll be posting more information as those webinars um, approach throughout the rest of the year. So thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that wonderful presentation. Um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Same to you.